let's get some questions going or some thoughts or piffy comments. I got I got some quick a quick question from uh, last week's parasha, um, Leviticus nineteen thirty one. Uh, which basically says not to turn to mediums or familiar spirits, uh, mm. not to seek after them and be tame or defiled by them. Um, and then I looked into that. It's kind of interesting of like what the modern day application of that would be. Rashi comments on that. And so that specific word, um, al tebaksu, or to seek, uh, basically means not to busy yourself or that is to um, occupy oneself with them. I guess I was wondering what the common application of that would be. There doesn't have to be a modern day application to every Torah prohibition. There are many laws that are just applicable at that time. There's some commandments that are completely extinct nowadays just because similar things aren't done. That's the problem of the Amorayim and later rabbis who tried to reapply every commandment to illustrate every commandment to our generation. This is why we have the whole notion of a talit katan, right? There's nowhere it says to wear a talit katan. If you believe in the oral law and your garment doesn't have four corners, then you're in the clear. Just like if you live in a tent, you don't need a mezuzah. But now I notice they even make mezuzahs for cars just because man is always in search for meaning. So there doesn't have to be a modern day application. And I think that's when we cause problems in religious life. When we keep reinterpreting a command to every generation to be applied in different ways. And then when someone doesn't meet that expectation, then they are one step out the door of religion. I was um, analyzing today the whole notion of Pagam Habris. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it because it's this is all these the, YouTube the prick. All right, no, no, that's Hatafas Tambris. Oh, okay. What, what are you referring to of? Pegam Habris is a Kabbalistic way of saying spilling of the seed. Zera Levatala. Oh, I never heard it said that way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pagam. Oh, guarding of, the, of your covenant. No, no, right? no, no, Isn't no. that what it translates to? That would be Shmir Sabris or Shmirat Sabrit. So Pagam means like to blemish the covenant. Right, but it's understood more in Kabbalistic circles, like you're blemishing, like your bris, i.e., your member when you're a male. It seems that that had one application when the Torah mentioned it. And mind you, it's not brought down as a Torah prohibition to masturbate. I know this is kind of weird. This has to be mentioned because it's all over the internet. Like it's the worst sin you could ever do. Now, clearly, the Torah doesn't bring it down like this. The closest thing the Torah brings down to that prohibition is the prohibition of having a seminal emission, what's later understood as kiri. So kiri, it's tied to two concepts, having a seminal emission while one is having sex or having what people would call nowadays a wet dream. That is what the Torah classifies as one thing that makes you unclean and one has to be separated or put outside the camp till overnight and then he comes back and then he's able to enter temple grounds and even enter a company or a group of men that are about to enter war. Now, that got translated later on because, of course, rabbis weren't content. They're not being a temple and no reason to worry about this prohibition. It got translated into masturbation, which is not what the Torah was talking about at all. And this first occurred in the era of the Amorayim because the Mishnah makes a statement in Masechet Nida that a man shouldn't touch himself down there to check either for carry or anything that he should use a cloth or on and on this and that. But then it ends there. And then the Amorayim, the rabbis in the Gemara, are the ones who took it 20 steps further saying that this is the worst sin ever. It's like you killed someone, it's like idolatry. They use Tame for that, or what, what's the words they use for that? Well, the Torah uses the word Tame because there's no notion of Tahor and Tame when you don't have a temple. Being Tame means you're impure, being Tahor means you're pure, but that's for temple ceremonies. But everything, when it's separated from the land of the temple, it loses its essence. Our religion was meant to function in an agrarian society that revolved around a temple. 
we no longer have that society and we no longer have a temple. So instead of saying, okay, these laws happen not to apply right now, they may apply in the future, our, our faithful rabbis said, well, that's not good enough. We're going to make them apply nowadays. And they started applying it to every area of life. And um, I'm pretty sure it was customary amongst other religious communities not to, to touch yourself down there, this and that. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, right? But I am Madonna, saying, right? <laughs> well, <Madonna>. it's, <laughs> it's not prohibited for a woman to do it. Well, she made a point about that. That's why I brought it up. And she's uh, in Kabbalah. Right. Well, the prohibition is on men. Now, the Ben Ishchai, which is a much, much later Akron, included it, prohibited on women. But the Talmud doesn't, the Mishnah doesn't, and the Zohar doesn't. Uh, but all these notions were invented by the Amorayim. So the Amorayim didn't have Smicha. The Amorayim lived and there was no temple. They were mainly in Babylon, although there were some in in Israel, but they were about to be all kicked out of Israel. So there was no smicha, relatively. I mean, there was maybe one or two guys who had smicha for Amorayim, but there was no smicha, there was no temple, there was no Sanhedrin. And then nowadays you have rabbis online teaching this like it's a Torah principle. Well, it's let not, me ask. Yep. Yeah. Sure. You're saying that, uh, so let me put it this way. Some people go, they'll say that the Torah is like the United States Constitution, right? And, you know, that, that's what it, they'll say. And if that is true in some respects, and we always reinterpret the Constitution with new things arise, I mean, you know, the Constitution says you have a right to bear arms. You know, that what happens when nuclear weapons are invented? Does that mean we can all carry around uh, bombs in our backyard, you know, in a pickup truck and, you know, drop it? So, so they'll say, okay, we need to reinterpret the t Constitution for this new um, thing that happened. Right now we have to sort of adjust. You don't think that's comparable to to the Torah itself that we can't now that something new arises. I mean, you got to be honest. I mean, let's be honest, Rabbi. We live in a world where pornography is just rampant with the internet, right. especially. So now, now it's going to make sense that masturbation and adultery and all these other type of uh, things, women being you know um, used for their bodies and God, you know. It's it's just it's just you know not something that Moses would have ever you know been experienced to you know. So regarding ethical commands, I agree that they should be applied and reapplied to fit our current generation, but not regarding ceremonial commands. Who came that we don't even know why we have them to begin with. We don't know why a priest is is deemed unfit or unclean if he happens to have sex with his wife and fill a seed outside. That we don't know the action or reason for that. So what we shouldn't do is create some other reason and say that it's applicable today and go even further and say that this is the worst sin that one can do in God's eyes. And on top of that, that it's worse than murder and that it's worse It's worse than idolatry. <laughs> wait, yeah. wait, wait, hold I'm sorry to interrupt. But so the reason why, why I brought up this is because I thought it's very serious because one of the first commandments that's given um, before they enter into the land is not to listen to soothsayers and so on. And then the whole commandment about prophets and all that. So in principle is not entertaining spiritism or isn't that in principle? Oh, that's clear high... Yeah. I mean, to visit a witch or a median, I mean, that's, that's not even, uh, of course, if you visit once a day, it would still be prohibited. Yeah, that was that was the root of my question. Yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure. So, I'm talking about yeah. things that don't have a practical reason. Clearly, if you're applying some redemptive qualities to a soothsayer who's able to speak in your behalf to the dead, and mind you, that we have King Saul doing this with the prophet Samuel. And that's kind of weird. And it's never it seems like that act in itself is never condemned. In that context, this is why a lot of the things that appear in the books of the writings are questionable. I was thinking about it today. I was thinking about Shimshon, the whole notion of Shimshon. It, it really sounds like Hercules. Our faith is not built off what appears in the prophets and the writings. It's based on what appears in the Torah. So we have people going out on a ledge trying to justify every every verse in the prophets and every verse in the writings when that doesn't make or break our religion. Right. It seems there's a lot of things there, especially like Esther. I mean, we spoke the last time how Mordechai is not a Jewish name. 
how Esther is not a Jewish name, <laughs> how it's tied to to Astar and and Marduk. Let's kind of go back to the source, okay, and know that all these things are just embellishments. And I believe, just like the Catholic Church did, that they used pagan concepts to wean people away from idolatry. Jewish people did the same thing, okay. It didn't change the initial message, but I think the Bible understood that the way you make things better is by little increments. There's no this whole all or nothing YouTube Jewish revolution it doesn't exist. This whole thing of burning your wigs immediately or yeah. doing drastic things immediately. I remember that one of these YouTube rabbis gave my friend advice that she should divorce her husband because her husband wasn't Jewish and she was even though they had two children together, all right? I mean, these people get stuck on first stage thinking. Yeah, I'm not okay. saying it's to go out and burn witches or anything like that. But well, that we can do. People. Well, I don't think that's an issue in the Jewish world of people seeking witches. I guess I guess my main question was, um, it says Tame before Moses was there, um, the whole thing about raising a prophet like Moses and all that. Well, we're going to go back. The, to no, 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 because it has to do with the soothsayers and all that, right? So obviously these people were kicked out of the land for the evil that they were doing, and it specifically mentions that. So I thought it's interesting. Um, the application today, uh, there's a lot of new age people, spiritists, and these people, you know, they're reading tarot cards and they're meditating and, they're opening themselves spiritually to something that it seems that Hashem prohibits. And right. he actually kicked people out of the land for that. So today, it, everything, it seems like religion today, um, when it comes to spirituality, is not the same as it was in ancient times. And I can understand that. Um, we're not burning people like we used to. We're not stoning people like we used to. But at the same time, Hashem kicked people out of the land for the reason, same reason. And um, he's instructing people to stay away from these things. That's what that's what I was getting into. Mm -hmm. How does that defile us um, in a modern day sense? Oh, it doesn't. Anything that has to do with defilement of being Tome or Tahor doesn't apply nowadays. But even if Hashem says, you know, these people were for the evil, they no, were no. kicked out of the land. And whenever so, the Torah so uses the word defile, there isn't an ethical or unethical connotation there. A woman is defiled after having a baby. That means that she did something wrong. Right. No, I mean, it, it just means that at that moment, for ceremonial purposes, she's unfit to enter the temple and you know be with her husband and on and on. But that doesn't mean that it has an ethical connotation to it. So it's Everyone okay else, for... I'm sorry, but it's, so it's okay for us to... No, no. There are things that are unethical that defile you, okay? But defilement in itself is not unethical. So yes, I mean, visiting a median here, one, but they have to be put to death. That has nothing to do with you being clean or unclean. That's the idea that they're peddling some weird ideology and they have to be eradicated from the land. That's the principle. That whether you're clean or unclean is completely secondary. And is not applicable nowadays. We're all unclean, first of all, because we don't have the ashes of the red heifer that remove what's called tumat met, which is the the impurity that comes from being in contact with a dead body. Even though I perhaps may have not touched a dead body, I'm sure I touched someone who touched someone who touched someone who touched a dead body. You know, so everyone is unclean nowadays. What does that mean that we're all on some very low ethical level? Not necessarily. Only because we don't have the notion of clean and unclean nowadays, what does it mean that it's okay to visit witches? Like, if that's what you mean. Yeah, so I guess uh, my question was the impact of associating... Okay, let me put it to you this way. I've had people within my... So you want to visit Una Santera? Or... No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, so check this out, right? You, I'm, I'm going to translate this saying, you're going to know what the saying is, all right? Uh, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are, right? Right. You know, you know the saying. Yeah. So associations mean things, right? That obviously, to what extent do we associate with people 
who delve into things that Hashem says are evil. But constantly, and the Israelites also had dealings with Gentiles. They no, but they're not like best friends with them and all that. Let me put it to you this way. I'm not a super spiritual person, but I have my own uh, personal experiences. So I've actually had um, family members who were into some weird looking into Eastern type religions and meditations and all that. And then they've literally said to me, I have a demon inside of me. And then weeks later, they committed suicide. I had two relatives, another relative that same thing, looking into Eastern religions, meditation and all that, very hateful, very um, cursing. And then they're telling me that they have a demon and they want to commit suicide. So I'm like, Okay, is this a coincidence or is there like a, a line that you draw with, you know, this is the Torah, this is pure versus this is some foreign mystical concept that we need to like put a border on? I don't know if that makes sense. The notion of being possessed by demons is not foreign to Judaism. I mean, it may be foreign to the five books of Moses, but it's spoken of in the Talmud, it's spoken of in Josephus. Jewish exorcists actually existed. I mean, Christians didn't invent this. I mean, this is what appears in the in the books of Josephus. He's, he speaks about rabbis who their job was to remove demons from you. I remember when I was in yeshiva in Israel, there's this, this rabbi, you guys probably know him, like he makes videos now on YouTube. His name is Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer. And uh, he's the only class that I skipped after after I skipped for for a couple of years just because him and I had a bad discussion, you know, because I'm just so not mystically inclined. But he had a practice that he would take you aside and he would remove the evil eye from you, the ayin hara. He had this method of taking it away from you. So what's the difference between that and removing the demon? You know, it's nothing. It's the same crap. Right? I mean, they do it nowadays in Kabbalistic circles. It's weird. It's not in the Torah, but that doesn't mean that it's not Jewish. I mean, something could be Jewish and not from the Torah and not... not at there's a, obviously, I think I get where, where he's coming from. I mean, there's obviously kosher... I, I, I don't know how to put it. Like, you, you not kosher. Only because somebody's accepted doesn't mean it's, it's kosher. I mean, you I mean, can't necessarily go to, like, the local palm reader to get your fortune, but... In, in a way, you could. You know, I'll tell you all that I'm reading is from Kabbalah. By the way, have you ever looked at tarot cards? It's Hebrew, and it all has Kabbalistic statements on it. Oh it's yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Of course, but Kabbalah speaks about when not just reading your palm, but reading the lines in your forehead. I said Mashiach is going to be able to uh, read your mind by reading the lines in your forehead. This is all Kabbalistic stuff. Well, um, there's, there's, there's parts of the Torah where it does talk about that, you know, the, there's this, you know, the Kohen Kadol would wear this uniform. He would, he would wear this chest uh, plate. They're called the chosen and they would be called the uh, youthim and through him. If that is how you pronounce it, I, yeah. I, I'm so hard with Hebrew yeah. and it would, gl and it would glow and the Kohen would be able to pronounce you, uh, you know, right. Like right. Yeah, right. sure. All right. So that actually appears in the Torah with the Urim Vatuvin. But they would throw it and we don't know exactly how it functions. What the rabbi sort of hopped in and said that, well, there's different opinions. I mean, some say that they were the name of God, like two letters on one, two letters on the other. And depending on how it would fall, how it will fall, then that you would know God's will. I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's true. So, but, but, but that's basically what he's saying. I mean, he, I, I think I get what he's trying oh, to say. He's, oh, but he's that's saying there's places you go to that are sanctioned by Torah and there and there's things that we should do that are applicable to our lives that are kosher. And there's obviously there's things that people are doing in their lives, like searching Eastern religions, which I, I would hopefully say everyone in the room is frowning upon. Yeah, of course we shouldn't search Eastern religions. We should search Judaism, but it, that's what it seems to me what he's saying, right? He's asking like, shouldn't we be looking for, for answers in the Torah, which is holy and, and, and kosher? And not necessarily foreign, uh, goyish, you know, whatever you want to call it. You know, things that appear in the Torah, we tolerate. Like those holy dice, they're there, right? But that one shouldn't try to find some applicable with similar practice amongst the goyim.
Well, that's what Avodah means. It means foreign practice or foreign service. It would still fall into the notion of seeing a medium or like a witch. Yeah, I, I don't you really think so. You so you're saying that, uh, but let me, but you wouldn't say like okay. It, it says in the Torah that um, a, a Jew should be taken to the Kohen, and 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 there's judgment pronounced on him whether he has sharat, uh, sarat, or however you pronounce it, biblical right. leprosy, right? Uh -huh. That would be a form of uh, that would be a ritual. That, that I mean, obviously, it's sanctioned in the Torah, right? It's written in the Torah. It's black and white. We can we can know and understand it. And then there are practices that people are doing that are you can you can clearly point in and say, whoa, you know, like let's let's you know let's let's watch it. <laughs> let's let's not go down that path, you know. No, I hear you, but only because it's done by a Jew nowadays. That we're talking about things that are not in Torah. Anything that appears in Torah is clearly allowed. We have no true Kohanim nowadays. We have like Suffolk Kohanim. The people who say they're Kohanim, the mystical understanding is that when Eliyahu and Elvi comes, some even has included the Mashiach in this notion that he's going to tell you who's the real Kohen and who are real Levium. Uh But till we have a real understanding of who Kohanim are, that we could actually establish a high priest, that we're not going to be able to uh, reinstitute the practice of declaring people with Sarat clean or unclean. Not that we have Sarat nowadays. It seems like Sarat was a illness that only happened to people in Eretz Yisrael, whatever, I mean, Sarat really is, because I guess it's not traditional leprosy. So what, but, would, what would you do if you ran across somebody that's not a Jew, you know, this person is not a Jew, they're a Gentile, and they're pretty smart, pretty friendly, um, they want to be your friend or whatever, but they're into all these spiritualistic pursuits that you know that Torah speaks against? Like, what would you do? I would be respectful and I would be friendly. I mean, look, that we're in Galut, okay? That we're supposed to make peace with our neighbors and even pray for our leaders who, by definition, are going to be idolaters because God never said that he's only going to exile you to no wide countries or, or nations full of righteous Gentiles, whatever a righteous Gentile really is. So I think that statement in Jeremiah, but that tells you to basically be in the world, but not of the world, to quote Paul, <laughs> um, is telling you to tolerate those around you. These laws are only really applicable in the land of Israel. No better, i.e. don't do it yourself, but I don't think it means that you're only supposed to be friends with Jews, because then by definition, you're never going to influence anybody. Yeah, that's, I think that's my main point, is how do you influence versus how do you, you can influence or you could be influenced, right? Uh, as I a mean, religious it, person, I think that you should live your life as an example always, but that doesn't mean whether you're going to walk around saying, well, I can't be your friend because you're a pagan, then by definition, you're not going to influence anybody. Right. Be friendly and be admirable and uh, lead. I don't see it as an excuse to be a hermit. No, no, I'm not saying that. Well, many people take it like that. This is why we have the notion of Jewish communities. I guess, I guess it's like um, 